This is the Introduction to Environmental Science, Unit 6, Lecture 23. Let's start off with a pop quiz. Who is replacing whom on which denomination of U.S. currency? This is not actually related to the topic of today's lecture. It has more to do with a current event. Well, current as in it's happened and uh, begun in the last year or so and will continue for a while. So, that's the question. Ten points extra credit to your unit test grade for a complete, note the word complete there, correct answer. Put your answer in the Lecture 23 Currency Pop Quiz Dropbox. And look for more as we wrap up this course. So, Ethics, Economics, and the Environments We've already done hazardous and solid wastes. That's why you're watching this lecture, because you've been through 22 also, Sustainable Economic Development. We're on Lecture 23, Environmental Ethics, the Foundation of Sustainable Society. I probably should change the title of this, but now I'm kind of locked into it, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. And then our final lecture will be Law, Government, and Society. And that'll be available once you have completed the quiz over Lecture 23. Making a change, 350.org. This is an image of some folks actually, well, demonstrating, but doing a uh, uh, kind of a crowdsourced, if you will, um, illustration of what should be in that dry valley. Should be water. And those are people holding up tarps to demonstrate that. It's a visual. And these are not Middlebury College students. They inspired this movement called 350.org. Middlebury College students challenged by a teacher and as college students they had a low budget but they wanted to fire up global awareness of climate change. They use the internet. Yeah, that's a great way to do things these days. Inspired local events. Local events but all around the world. It wasn't just local events. This happens to be in New Mexico. Uh, they also, uh, Middlebury College has been in Vermont. They did them there. Uh, but uh, they, they did them in Italy. They did them in Micronesia. Uh, the small events. The name, 350.org, comes from that level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Remember carbon dioxide, that greenhouse gas. Beyond which global warming is thought to be inevitable. 350 parts per million. Uh, currently, we are at 400 parts per million. We haven't been at 350 parts per million since the 1960s. So, is climate change inevitable? Well, by this way of thinking. But they've inspired a lot of things. Demonstrations. There's a thing called a moving planet. If I can get it to come up. Hello, moving planet. There we are. Right there. Travel the world. Uh, and it raises awareness for people of what's actually going on. And I think, and you may or may not know this character, but the face of Bo. You know the face of Bo? No? No one knows the face of Bo? Well, that's the face of Bo. Uh, this is the face of Bo. Right here. He's actually a, uh, a character from Doctor Who. I think he inspired them. Anyway, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you'll, you'll get that cultural reference. If you're not, this is actually from the Doctor Who, Muse Who Museum in England. So, this is what we're talking about. Environmental policy and law. What is policy? What drives policy? And then that cyclic nature of environmental policy and what makes it go around. This idea of the precautionary principle, very important. Some major environmental laws we're going to talk about. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. I use shorthand. I use a lot of shorthand. So CAA is Clean Air Act. CWA Clean Water Act and ESA, Endangered Species Act. You'll see those used elsewhere. How do we implement policy? What happens internationally? How do you enforce international policies? And a couple of examples of citizen science. The Christmas Bird Counts by Audemont and the University of Florida's Lake Watch program. Quote from Margaret Mead, Never doubt 
that a small, highly committed group of individuals can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Indeed. I think that's very especially true when we look around the global events today. So what is environmental policy and law? This is a recycling center image. Uh, we're uh, kind of demonstrating the sorts of recycling that goes on in this particular place. Public policy. That is a set of rules or decisions that influence. Corporately, we come up with these ideas through government, if you will, influence how we act as individuals and as a society. Environmental policy is designed to protect natural resources and public health. Not always in that order, actually. Public health often trumps natural resources, although the two are intimately linked. Hopefully we've gotten that across in this course. Generally, we take these protections for granted in this country. Theoretically, in this democratic system, policies are established through negotiation and compromise. I like that word. It doesn't always work that way, and we know it doesn't always work that way. Recycling is a case in point. If we were to take a vote of people in the great state of Florida, probably the majority of them would not think that recycling was something that was, well, I'm being, that's probably not true, maybe it really does like to recycle, but it's not something we voted on. Recycling is something that was basically decided more at the uh, national level and it has trickled down. The state of Florida has a goal that 75% of all household waste, commercial waste, college waste, be recycled by 2020. Those rules implemented by this law, the state level, are slowly trickling down to the local level. I think it trickles down to the local level faster if those local levels don't have a lot of land to use for landfills. So, what drives policy making? It isn't always what it seems. This is a uh, factcheck.org. This is from a uh, recent session of the, uh, I guess, uh, Florida uh, legislature, where fracking was proposed as something that we should uh, we should be doing. Well, <laughs> power and influence inevitably control much of that policy making. Economic interest groups, in the case of fracking, would be the oil industry, industry associations, labor unions, individuals often have disproportionate. It's not always equal. You can't just call up your representative and say, hey, representative, I need this done. Some people can do that. Uh, I can't. <laughs> However, public interest groups can gain similar access by developing broad support by highlighting what's going on in these state legislatures, bringing citizens to the Capitol meet legislatures. Often, groups organize public events and protests. Well, they lack the money for influencing public policy. But in this case, it did. Sometimes these citizens initiated environmental movements, like 350.org, can move globally and be important historically. China, in response to protests, because that's how they respond to things, has recently modified a lot of their policies in response to environmental complaints. Complaints is a little bit of a weak word for it, environmental disasters. Um, some of the uh, manufacturing processes have uh, uh, completely uh, turned their rivers into uh, un unusable uh, uh, dump sites uh, for, for heavy metals. Globally, support for environmental protection is becoming more widespread. It is very widespread, particularly in the developed world. 2007, BBC polled 22,000 residents of 21 countries. Now, 22,000, um, gosh, it sounds like a lot of people when you compare it to the total population of the world. It's probably not so many. But it's still it's a large number. 21 countries, so I think this is, you know, we could consider this to be representative. 21 countries found that 70% on average of respondents said they were personally ready. They are ready to make sacrifices to protect the environment. A sacrifice is something like recycling, okay? Not throwing that garbage out the window. Um, 
not changing your oil in the in the, the driveway and letting it roll into the grass, that sort of thing. Here's the numbers. BBC poll, environmental attitudes. The blue line is yes, definitely and probably necessary for the protection. Uh, number one, the top country in terms of percent of people who support protecting the environment is in Canada. Surprisingly, at least based on what we know, but China has a lot of people in it, 1.4 billion people. They're number two, they're second. These are all good numbers in the 70s, 80s. The lowest numbers, well, India is a bit uh, low, but in Russia, uh, those environmental attitudes aren't quite the same. Uh, almost, uh, uh, I would say that's probably not statistically significantly different in Russia, uh, but the people who don't think that protecting the environment is not or probably not necessary. So, we've seen this before. We looked at uh, Thomas Edison using this scientific flowchart of discovery. He used observations, asked questions. Okay, how do I make a better light bulb? He formed hypotheses, made predictions, and did this whole cycle. When he was making a light bulb, he did it 2,000 times, and he found 2,000 ways not to make a light bulb. That's how hypothesis testing works. Well, environmental policy it's very similar to how the scientific method works. First of all, you identify the problem, and then you set that agenda. That's kind of like the, okay, identify the problem, then come up with hypotheses. Talk about it. See who, who is going to support that agenda. Develop the proposals. That's hypotheses formulation. We don't get to hypothesis testing until we actually enact this law or rule. We implement it. Now we're actually testing the hypothesis and seeing what do the data tell us. Were we right or do we have to go back, make changes to that process? And this process repeats itself many, many times. We'll see this in other environmental rules where we think, well, we, we did it right, but then we realize, oh, it needs a tweak <laughs> or more. It needs to be replaced. So building support is central to policy development. Things, this is not my hat, um, many people feel that way about it, but uh, honestly, often groups hire lobbyists who can dedicate a lot of time to develop support of legislatures who are going to write these laws. Common strategy, finance those commentators on radio and television. Okay, raise your hand if you get your news from either of those sources. Well, I still get mine from radio, because I'm old school. But most of us get it from our phones or from our tablets, from the internet. Rarely does it we get it from the newspaper anymore, which is another story. Parent position of neutrality, these commentators, can promote a particular point of view. And you, there may not be anything wrong with you. You may feel that, well, that's what I want. I want to know what the, the agencies think or what this, this industry thinks. And that's, that's fine. But you need to be aware of that. Watching the media, it's always a good idea to follow the money. Whoops, I want to follow that money. Come on, back, there we go. Learn more about those views that have been expressed. What happened to my pen? There we see if that's it. Follow the money. Yeah, I didn't want a pen, I wanted that. There we go. How that changed, I don't know. Go learn more about it, about those views that are expressed. Okay. Next policy step is implementation. We see the uh, circled, pre-circled, that image of the Everglades snail kite carrying her snail back to the nest to feed. Um, why do we protect these birds? Well, ideally, government agencies faithfully carry out policy directives as they organize bureaucracies and provide services and enforce the rules and regulations. Not necessarily, this is an obscure bird, at least to most of us, um, but not to those folks who, who uh, watch birds, birds of prey, very important predators. Often, continued public attention, particularly from Audubon in this case, is needed to make sure the government enforces its own rules. In this case, endangered species protections. Once a rule is enacted, it almost invariably requires reevaluation, improvement, replacement over time. 
Awful Mods will expire after a designated number of years. So it is necessary, necessary to reauthorize that law. Vote again. Put it back to the public and say, hey, do you all still support this thing? So reauthorization and change to the Endangered Species Act. We'll talk about that act in just a moment. Uh, but the act was passed in Congress in 1966. Since that time has been modified, we have redefined what it means to be an endangered species and an threatened species. There's an assignment, it's an extra credit assignment, worth a few points. You'll see that at the end of the lecture, History of the Endangered Species Act. A better safe than sorry brings up the idea of precaution and the precautionary principle. When an activity threatens to harm health or the environment, we need to know what, what, what's going on. We understand those risks before we initiate that activity. According to this principle, the precautionary principle, for example, we shouldn't mass market new chemicals, new cars, or children's toys, safety equipment, all that sort of stuff, until we're sure that they're safe. Those car seats need to be safe. European Union has adopted this precautionary principle as the basis of its environmental policy. U.S., we haven't done that yet, and we may not ever do that, um, because of the threat we see in terms of how it's implemented in the EU to productivity and innovation. Precautionary principle, more detail, for first proposed in 1998. Really, not just environmental health, but applies to human health as well. Actually, more aptly applies to human health as well. Action or policy has a risk of causing harm to the public or the environment. If you don't have scientific consensus or scientific evidence or scientific proof, hard to go with scientific proof, everybody agrees with, that the action or policy isn't harmful, then the burden of proof falls to those taking the action to prove that it's not harmful. You can't say scientifically it's not harmful. You have to prove it to those people who want to pose this new chemical or this new car seat. Make sure it's safe. Maybe a better way of putting it, because that's a little bit confusing. Precautionary measures should be taken to reduce or prevent such harm, even if the science has not been fully documented. If there's a suspicion of some sort of a harm, then we should take action. Remember Flint, Michigan from an earlier lecture? There's still problems with, and there will be problems, with lead in the water for as long as there are, uh, there's lead solder in the pipes. So the pipes have to be replaced. It'll be a while. Precautionary principle. We've identified only 2 million of the estimated 5 to 10, 100 million, not 10 million, 100 million species, environmental scientists estimate are in the world. How do we know what to preserve? Well, that's a hard thing. Species are the primary components of biodiversity. I don't know if I've talked about this before. Uh, pre preservation of all species should be a high priority. I certainly talked about that before. But there's a, uh, some researchers at uh, the Archibald Biological Station uh, in the southern part of Highlands County who, every time they go out into the scrub, they find a new species. How do we protect those species? There's, you find one little animal and that's it. You know, it's, it's a threatened and endangered species. Well, we can't go out and preserve. We don't know enough about them. We have to preserve ecosystems or habitats. That's how we exercise this precaution. Look at some major environmental laws. Put on countless laws to protect the water we drink, air we breathe, food we eat. There's a recall for some uh, bacteria in the food we eat. It's due to not because uh, uh, the manufacturer, and of course we've developed this system over many years, uh, thought it was a good idea, but it's because federal regulators found something in there that was, was wrong. Also the biodiversity that surrounds us. Most of these laws work to negotiate a balance between those differing interests and those needs of various interest groups also between private and public interests. We look at some of our most important environmental policies in the United States in the next few slides. First of all, National Environmental Policy Act 1969 establishes public oversight. 
cornerstone of U.S. environmental policy. NEPA does three important things. First of all, it authorizes the Council on Environmental Quality, which is the oversight board, oversees what the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency does and the other agencies that do environmental protection, what they do. Second, directs federal agencies to take environmental consequences into account. It's federal law that federal agencies do this. In decision making, they have to do a thing called an environmental impact statement. It has to be published for every major federal project likely to have an important impact on environmental quality. Like this. The dam, wherever this one is, certainly uh, required a, uh, an environmental impact statement because of the, the uh, amount of water it's holding back, the amount of uh, uh, land it flooded. Uh, anytime we build a pipeline, we're supposed to do environmental impact statement because it has the, uh, the potential to have an impact on the environment particularly where that pipeline would cross uh, rivers or streams. Certainly that's an impact place. Clean Air Act, CAA, 1970. We don't have those sorts of smokestacks anymore. Well, we still have the stacks, we just don't have the smoke coming out of them. Uh, first major environmental legis legislation, say that word three times fast, to follow NEPA was the Clean Air Act, 1970 provided the first nationally standardized rules that basically took care of all those air contaminants, made our air much safer, better to breathe. Clean Water Act protects surface water, aimed to make the nation's waters swimmable and fishable. I put them in swimmable because I'm not a fisherman. First goal of the CWA, identify and control those point sources, those pipes that are dumping all that stuff out them into uh, receiving waters with factories, sewage treatment plants, other sources, things like that. Later, Clean Water Act used to address stormwater runoff, ag runoff. Act has been used to promote watershed-based planning. Remember the Cuyahoga River? We used that as an example several lectures back. Cuyahoga River burning was not due to some natural, the algae was caught, catching on fire and burning. No, that was because uh, industry was spewing uh, burnable things, whether it was oil or gas or what it was, and it was then catching fire. Uh, and that is the end of pipe. That was one of those, I guess, catalytical things, catalysts for the Clean Water Act. When I say watershed-based planning, if I've thrown this number out before, if you're going to clean up a lake, uh, it costs, if it's contaminated, polluted, degraded, it costs $10,000 per acre of lake surface. If you're going to prevent that pollution in the first place, it costs $100 per acre of watershed. Now, watershed's bigger than the lake, but the dynamic is there. Endangered Species Act protects wildlife. Like this guy, black-footed ferret, how cute. 1973. ESA identified and listed species that are vulnerable, threatened, or endangered. Therefore, the name. Once a species is listed as endangered, the Act provides for rules to protect it, make its habitat, environment, ideally in order to make that recovery possible. Black-footed ferret. Ferrets are, are uh, not very common in the wild, certainly not the black-footed ones. Uh, apparently they're used for, uh, or were used, uh, for coats, uh, for uh, uh, minks and things like that. Not minks, obviously, because um, it's not a mink. But they also live on the prairie, and much of the prairie has been farmed, or being farmed. So, recovery of black-footed ferret is a uh, tall order. Superfund, we talked about this in the previous lecture. Superfund Act. Hazardous sites. Superfund is easier to say than its acronym. Create a giant fund to help remediate abandoned toxic sites, or sites that weren't quite abandoned yet, but were still toxic. Proper name, CERCLA. Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980. Act addresses those sites that have been abandoned. Emergency spills of hazardous materials, or in control contamination, 
some sort or other. Allows the EPA to establish liability so the polluters can pay for the cleanup. We talked earlier about the Gold King mine. Uh, that was a surplus site, and then the EPA came in and made it not so much better. Hopefully they fix that. So how do you implement these policies? Laws we've discussed briefly above, most important protections. Each of these laws resulted from action at local, state, and national levels. We wouldn't have Endangered Species Act if citizens hadn't really gotten involved. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, all those things, we saw the need, we, the citizens, saw the need, we talked to our elected representatives, we got their support and they negotiated those policies. Primary law can be established and modified in each of these three branches of the government. In fact, it needs all three. The legislative branch writes those laws. Judicial branch judges, rules, make sure that they fit within the other law framework uh, of laws. The executive branch actually carries out the laws that the, the passed by the legislature and approved by the judiciary. So some selected laws, Wilderness Act of 1964, fairly famous one. We now have a wilderness preservation system because of that. We already talked about NEPA, talked about the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and talked about the Marine Protection Act. In a previous lecture I talked about, uh, showed the slide of, of how much uh, waste was being dumped directly in the ocean. Well, in 1972 that was supposed to stop in this country. It didn't actually stop until 20 years later. Some more laws. Endangered Species Act, we talked about that. There's an assignment coming on that. Safe Drinking Water Act, 1974. Set standards for safety of drinking water. Major changes were made uh, in those two decades. And then this idea of Resource Conservation Recovery Act, talked about that in a previous lecture. And then CERCLA, we just talked about. And then, well, the start out, CERCLA uh, Superfund started out with a mere $1.6 billion in it. Uh, 14 years later, they realized, oh, we need more money, so they put $8.5 billion in it. I think they're reauthorizing again with uh, about uh, another, I don't know if it's going to be that major an, an upgrade, uh, but more money is needed because it's very expensive to clean these places up. There are laws, statutes, enacted by Congress and signed by the President. We can be involved in this process by writing or calling our elected representatives appearing at public hearings. Make your voice heard. All bills and public laws are public. Find the details of any national law. Same is true with the state law. Uh, well, you can't find it in thomas.gov. thomas.gov is not named after Thomas Edison. It's probably named after Thomas Jefferson. But that's, uh, that's a great site. It actually is uh, rather user-friendly. Citizens can be involved by writing or calling those folks we elected. Oh, go vote. Yeah. This is an example. Talked about 350.org. This is a protest they organized in Micronesia. That, uh, that banner there represents 350 parts per billion uh, in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide. I talked about that earlier. Well, the reason these people are sitting in water is because that's where the beach would have been if the uh, carbon dioxide level had stayed at 350 parts per million. Didn't. Clearly the level is up higher than that and the water is higher than that. And this particular island nation is really going to drown. So talk about legislation, now let's talk about the judicial branch. Decides what, what the precise meaning of a law is. What does that really mean? whether or not laws have been broken, or whether a law violates the Constitution. It takes time to work its way to number three, for sure. Interpretation is needed because legislation is written, imagine that, is written vaguely to get it passed. <laughs> uh, general terms so they make it widely enough accepted to gain passage, gain acceptance by a wide number of folks. Folks meaning legislators law may have been broken it becomes a matter of criminal law or civil law, which is not really it does become environmental law after a bit. U.S. Supreme Court ultimately is the decider whether law is consistent with the Constitution of the United States. That's their primary mission. All their laws, uh, 
or subservient, if you will, to that. This is an image of a previous Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, there are nine justices uh, in general, and uh, this particular image, I believe, is from 2015. So the executive branch directs what goes on with law. Administrates, it administrates law. More than 100 federal agencies, thousands, I think it's more like tens of thousands of state and local boards, commissions, lots of employees, lots of people out there doing this stuff that oversee environmental rules, bodies set rules, decide disputes. My neighbor built this fence on my property and now I want him to tear it down. That's an environmental issue, honestly. Investigates misconduct. EPA, primary federal agency, the responsibility for protecting environmental quality. They have passed the authority to enforce these laws. You don't see the EPA driving around trucks in, in, uh, in neighborhoods. You, you might, and you probably don't see many DEP people. But the actual, I guess, uh, enforcement of these laws falls to uh, state agencies for the most part. Usually it's an environmental protection department. Uh, in Florida, it's the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Other agencies that have environmental impacts, regulate environmental impacts, Department of the Interior, public lands, Department of Ag, forests and grasslands, and, well, agriculture. So, these, over, these uh, administrative rules within the executive branch, agencies, boards, and commissions oversee environmental policies through the EPA. It's quite important, quite powerful, if you will. Decide disputes, investigate misconduct, kind of like we do at the local level. Federal level rules can have a lot further reaching consequences. Executive rules can be made quickly. That's the point of the executive. He's elected to bypass, in some instances, Congress. Little interference from Congress, little public oversight or discussion uh, until he violates the Constitution. And then the judicial branch kicks in and says, no, you can't do that. Binds the, the executive's hands and they have to go back and uh, work their way through legislature. Often, uh, the executive thinks, and rightly so, there are times when executives can make the right decision and it works out okay. Other times, not so much. So the EPA is the primary, most well-known federal agency responsible for protecting the environment. Implements Clean Air, Clean Water Acts, uh, a few others. DOI, Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Wildlife Refuges ministers the Endangered Species Act, ESA. ESA kind of belongs to Fish and Wildlife. Army, believe it or not, the Army is very much involved in this through the Army Corps of Engineers because of their drainage projects, because they keep us from flooding. They are charged with and responsible for wetlands regulation throughout the country. Almost no matter what the size of that wetland is, it's not connected to a federal project directly, um, it's been interpreted that the Army Corps of Engineers you have to talk to them. Ultimately, these agencies are responsible to the political interests of the president and the legal responsibilities of the agency. But, it's such a large government, there's a lot of inertia, it takes time to change things. So things don't happen very quickly, even though they may be ordered to happen quickly. Let's take a look closely, or at something not very closely, it's something that's more close to where we are. Fishing Creek uh, is a uh, uh, watershed that the uh, nation's largest wetland reserve conservation easement. It's located actually in western Highlands County. Uh, 30,000 acres, well, the Fishing Creek watershed's a lot more than that, but they took about 30,000 acres of land and put it in conservation easement. And these are the guys that did it. Part of agriculture, Oversees two different agencies. U.S. Forest Service manages about, uh, well, you can read it, a lot of national forests, 193 million acres. NRCS works for, works with Aglands, and they're the ones who implement this, these large wetland reserve projects to protect wetlands, to actually increase the amount of wetlands, turning farmland that has drained wetlands back into wetlands because that protects downstream receiving waters. This particular project is going to uh, remove a, a tremendous amount of nutrient flow to Lake Okeechobee. 
ultimately, they are responsible to the executive branch. So how much government do we want? Well, changes over time, depending on who's, where the pendulum's swinging. Well, Ronald Reagan, 1981, he said, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. And that's a controversial statement. Perennial debate, certainly very active, very active debate. Is government a power that undermines personal liberties, seen by some, or government a defender of liberties and rights and the common good? Well, why do we still debate this? Because maybe both these views are correct, more than partially correct. There are times when the government is a power that undermines personal liberties, there's also times when we rely on the, and parts of government will do the, the, the same thing, uh, do these two things at the same time. So, we're going to continue to have this debate, no doubt. What about internationally? Nations have become increasingly interested in signing on to international agreements to protect the environment because they see the environment is degrading, like that, that picture of that uh, island nation in the Pacific. They don't have as much land as they did 50 years ago. Why not? Well, gosh. Convention or treaty, those are terms we also use. Treaties are more binding. Conventions are not. Hello. There we go. Principal motivation for these treaties is recognition that countries no longer act alone. We can't act alone because the interests of the environment go outside our borders, outside our boundaries. We talked about the tragedy of the commons. It's a shared resource. If we don't protect that resource in common, uh, all the nations, those at least those who influence um, a particular resource, then we're all going to suffer. Somebody might benefit from it. Water resources, atmosphere, endangered species, other concerns cross international boundaries. And I, I use this example of mercury and fish. We have fishing rules, limits, that say you can't consume fish consumption limits. I'll get, get out the right words here in a minute. Fish consumption limits for mercury and fish tissue in Florida, but that mercury does not come from Florida. We aren't dumping mercury thermometers. We aren't burning coal in Florida or anywhere else. We are burning coal elsewhere in the United States. But that coal is not what's contaminating our lakes. It's that coal, which is where the mercury is coming from, in rainfall that originates in foreign countries. So a Clean Air Act for foreign countries would be a good thing to lower that mercury risk for fish in Florida. Some major international agreements. Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. I love that. Cities. Basically, we tried at the same time we were doing the Endangered Species Act to make it international and to protect, because species certainly are not just in this country, so cities. Montreal Protocol, we talked about that when we talked about uh, the global atmosphere and how this is a successful one. It's just a protocol, supposedly. Uh, reduced tremendously the amount of chlorofluorocarbons that are produced and then released to try to protect the ozone. The Basel Convention, which we haven't talked about at all, restricts shipment of hazardous wastes across international borders, tries to protect developing countries from having waste dumped on them without their consent. And the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change started in 1994. Governments are supposed to share data. That's the main purpose of this UN Framework. Uh, develop national plans for controlling greenhouse gases, very controversial thing and then cooperate in adapting to climate change. Another, how do you, you know, how are you going to adapt? Well, I don't want to do that. That's, that's your thing. Well, so we still fight about this, and we will. Often enforcement depends upon national pride. Enforcement, you have to be, you have to think, well, I don't want to be that bad guy in this case. Depends upon the idea that countries care about their reputation. And some countries don't. Okay, we'll get that out there right now. But many, most do. They're reluctant to appear irresponsible or worse, immoral, which is another way of looking at it, in the eyes of the international community. So that persuasion, that public embarrassment, that 350.org stuff can be effective at getting 
these governments' attention. Sharing the spotlight on these training pressures, well, I say often, in certain cases it doesn't, they don't care, but it will push a country to comply more with international agreements. Also, the, uh, the threat of possibly uh, economic, uh, e economically, I guess, uh, changing the way you, you relate to them is another way of looking at it. There's an image of uh, the uh, uh, President of the United States at the time, Obama, meeting, I'm not sure, I believe that's with uh, uh, Chinese uh, Premier, I could be wrong, uh, talking about climate change. And this is the other side of the coin. Sometimes countries, and I'll use Japan in particular, these are all, you can see these, these are bluefin tuna, big tuna, big fish. These look, they look like cow carcasses. But Japan did not want to regulate bluefin tuna as endangered. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do that. There we go. Keep going. 2010, protection for bluefin tuna was proposed and defeated by Japan. Long lived, top predators, they lived to be 70 or 80 years old. We now have less than 15% of them present in the ocean. They had objections to fishing limits. Japan, well, most countries don't like to be told what they can or can't eat. Uh, bluefin tuna is a, uh, a, a, well, a delicacy now because you can't get much of it. Uh, it's uh, used in sushi. Use the same arguments about whaling. Now, most nations in the world, seagoing nations, have banned whaling. Um, very few still do it. The Japanese still have a whaling fleet. They still go out, but they, they collect uh, a thousand whales every year for, for scientific research. That's not what they do with them. They eat them. Economics increasingly plays a role. And I don't mean to be judgmental, okay? That's what they do. Um, 2012, a single 290, 500, 593 pound, 263 kilogram, big old dog there, bluefin tuna, was caught off northeastern Japan, sold for $736,000, and on a per pound basis, that's $1,238 per pound of bluefin tuna. That's expensive sushi. We're running out of them. So what can you do as an individual? What are you interested in? What do you, what do you care about? You can participate in policy form formulation. Help to contribute to understanding and protecting, well, the common environment, whether it's air, water, soil. Uh, you like scrub? Great. Protect it. I like water. Communicating the ideas of environmental science requires that we, meaning me as an educator, the policymakers, those people we elect, uh, anybody, you get into artists, the great art colony, uh, who, who they all they do is, is draw pictures of, of nature. And it, it, it's out there, and people say, wow, that's beautiful. Where'd you see that? Well, I saw it out in, in the wild. Um, wow, can I go see that? Well, you better hurry. Writers. Engineers, very important to have economists, business leaders, engineers, these people who are more, I guess, mechanically in, inclined, involved in communicating these ideas in environmental science. Environmental educators, we're needed to help train and increase our environmental literacy. So you can make decisions. You may not agree with what I say, but at least you know what's going on, what's really happening. So let's look at a couple of examples of citizen science. First of all, Audubon's Christmas bird count. These people are standing in the snow. Um, why? Because every Christmas since 1900, groups of volunteers, like these hardy souls here, have gone out. This is designated areas. I think they, they, they do bird counts all over the country. 2012, 2,200 teams, more than 60,000 people got out in the snow and froze. They counted 61 million birds. That's a lot of birds. Especially birds per person. Wow, do that math. Birds were found in 2,309 species. That's pretty good. Mostly, it's done in North America, even in Florida. So in Florida, if you want to do the Christmas bird count, you don't have to go stand in the snow because we probably won't have snow on Christmas. Teams from the Caribbean in the Pacific, Central, South America also participate. Mostly it's North America. Another example of citizen science is the Florida Lake Watch Program. I dearly love the Florida Lake Watch Program. Started by the University of Florida Professor Dan Canfield in 1986. Basically, it was established in statute by Florida 
Florida Legislature, 1991, Florida Statute 1004.49. Currently, there are over a thousand trained volunteers, including me, monitoring more than 600 lakes, rivers, and coastal sites. Largest, it is the largest, yay, Florida, largest citizen water quality effort in the nation. Lake Watch, in partnership with UF, saves local government. Talking about local government in Highlands County, where SFSC is based, close to a quarter of a million dollars per year in water quality sample analysis. And over the years, that is millions of dollars. It's very important. Citizen science. So this is an assignment. This is a history. This is actually a, a page from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's article on the history of the Endangered Species Act. And here's extra credit assignment. It's extra credit. You do not have to do this, but if you're looking for a few points, write a 100 word or less. If you can get it in less, that's great because I have to read these things. Summary of the changes to the ESA as outlined in this information. And that is a link, and I will also post that link uh, in the assignment itself. History of the Endangered Species Act. And it's worth 50 points. The unit test portion of your grade. Extra credit, though. Sort of like a pop quiz, except you have to write more. So it's worth more. Yeah. In summary, what we talked about today were environmental policy and law. What is policy? What drives it? Public interest, need. The cyclic nature of environmental policy. Recall that uh, we talked about how Edison had to make 2,000 light bulbs wrong before he made one right. Sometimes environmental policy is like that. Often it's like that, cyclic in nature. So the precautionary principle that we need to be more protective of how we implement these laws and certainly find areas where before we put a new product on the market that it isn't going to cause harm. Some major environmental laws, we talked about the Clean Air Act, CAA, Clean Water Act and Endangered Species Act, see that extra credit assignment. Oh, I didn't mention this, it is due by the end of the term, since this is the last unit of the term that's coming up. How do you implement these policies? International policies. How are they enforced? Mostly by, uh, well, common agreement, treaty. And citizen science. Two examples. Christmas bird counts by Audubon, or managed by Audubon, run by Audubon, and Florida Lake Watch, University of Florida program. These are some of the references for this. Most of this lecture actually was taken from Principles of Environmental Science, Inquiry and Applications, 7th edition. Read that, and I'll leave you with an image of Lake Watch volunteers looking at, you can't hardly see it, there's a round disc there in the water, uh, a secchi disc.